Hello and welcome back to my channel. Oh hi, if you're new, my name is Emma, I'm a complex grad, film student, and I um, <coughs> have a problem. Am I gonna go and say that I'm on a no buy? I mean, I would, but we know that they don't really tend to work for me or last very long. And I think whenever I'm like, I'm on a no buy, I, all I do is jinx it. All I do is jinx it. So. Hello and welcome back to my channel. She bought more books, of course she fucking did. And before I start this video though, I hit 50,000 subscribers, so thank you guys. I just wanna say, that was really fun, cool. Anyway, most of these things, are, well, no. Half of these things I have bought because of other things that I read and then really enjoyed. I was like, I need, I need the complete set. I am a sucker for a complete set. If you wanna do like, if you want me to buy all the books of something, do them in pretty editions that will match. I am a hoe for aesthetics. We know this, this is not news. It shouldn't be news to anyone, even if you're new. Are you surprised? No. I bought so much more things, and like, it's kind of like a birthday present to myself, so it's still fine. I know it's May, but it's still a birthday present to myself. Most of this is because of things I've read that I enjoyed and then wanted more of. A good chunk of plague literature, and then things that you are like, Emma, buy this, and I was like, <laughs> okay. So we're gonna do this in no, mm, you know what, no, we are gonna do this in a particular order. I'm gonna save the ones that I know you've recommended to me the most to last, so you'll have to just stay tuned, won't you? <laughs> Look at me. Look at that audience retention. Look at that go. There's so many of them, I need to talk about them together. I'm gonna put these on the floor before I drop them. Let's talk about Mitford. If you're a long-term viewer of my channel, this will come as no fucking surprise. Out of everybody, I've probably read the most of Nancy Mitford's books. I've read all of her historical biographies. They're, they're fucking great. And now I'm starting to go through her fiction. I read The Pursuit of Love last year during lockdown, and I really enjoyed it. I think that they're, they're doing an adaptation of it. I don't know if it's the BBC who are doing it, or if it's meant to be a series. It's got Lily James in it, and I'm quite excited for it, actually. Like, um, I also watched Mamma Mia 2 recently, which was a mood. And now me and my friend just keep playing Abba the entire time and we have no fucking regrets screaming Mamma Mia out the window. That's a different conversation. But yeah, like, I'm really excited to watch that. I'm actually quite surprised that it's been adapted because it's not... I feel like Mitford isn't somebody that that many people know about. When I mention her to people, usually responses, who's that? So I read Pursuit of Love last year and then recently I read Love in a Cold Climate. And it's so funny. Mitford is so, so funny. And if the thing is, if you don't understand that she's taking the piss, you're gonna be like, this is so, this is ridiculous, this is so pretentious, whatever. But you have to understand with Mitford, she's taking the piss. And once you get that, oh, her stuff is fucking glorious. So but more of it, and well actually, this is her fiction and this is something else that I'll get onto. So I bought <clears throat> The Blessing. Christmas pudding, wigs on the green, and don't tell Alfred. Um, I'll start with this one because The Pursuit of Love, Love in a Cold Climate, and Don't Tell Alfred are from the same person's point of view. Her name is Fanny. So The Pursuit of Love is about her cousin. So she like watches her cousin's love life and that's like, it's a commentary on that. The second one is about a friend of hers, and like her love life, her, the friend is called Polly. So she's like watching her love life. Um, and then this, is set, I think she's already middle-aged by the time this book happens. The first two happen when she's a bit younger, like 20s and stuff, um, like childhood, 20s, and then this is when she's an adult, because um, she's married to Alfred, who's an Oxford Don, and like, she's very happy, moved to the countryside, and like, Oxford is like, living, she's basically like, living her quiet little life, and she loves it. It's got a couple of kids, and it's quite nice, um, but then I know that happened in this, but they, he becomes an ambassador, and then they fuck off to Paris and she's like, holy shit. But from such a quiet, like, unassuming character who, like, gives fantastic comment from fucking everything, um, I'm just excited to have, like, her point of view now because I'm like, come on, Fanny, have your story. I'm quite excited for it. Also, look at these covers. They're just fucking gorgeous. There is, like, a collected editions of Nancy Mitford's fiction. This, again, is a beautiful edition, but I just kind of wanted all the pretty ones. All the pretty ones together, which I now have. 
<laughs> all of them. <laughs> I don't have a problem. But this is just, it's just like a continuation of a character that I love so dearly anyway, in like a world that I know with characters that I know. So it's quite an easy, it's nice for a reference point. Um, and it's just, Nancy Mitford is like my comfort. She's one of my comfort reads. Um, absolutely. Like if you want slightly, and I really only mean slightly, higher brow stuff to, I was gonna say read by the pool this summer, but you know, read in the garden on the Ikea deck chairs that come out once every two years in that like one week of good weather we have in the UK. This will do it. I read my, I read Love and Cold Quan, Quan, Climate, Climate really quickly. Um, and I'm, I'm currently reading, I'm currently reading Chris Voss, Never Split the Difference, which is, which is a book on negotiating. Um, so once I finish that, I will pr probably follow it up with this. Or will I? I have some quite exciting things here, to be quite honest, but I think I might read this. It's just, oh, this is comfort reading. I really enjoy this. Fanny is married to an absent-minded Oxford Don Alfred and content with her role as a plain Tweedy housewife, but overnight her life changes when Alfred is appointed English ambassador in Paris. In the blink of an eye, Fanny is mixing with royalty, Rothschilds and Dior clad wives, throwing cocktail parties and having every indiscreet remark printed in tomorrow's papers. But with the love lives of her friends to organize an aristocratic squatter who won't budge in the antics of her maverick son to thwart, Fanny He's far too busy to worry about the diplomatic crisis looming on the horizon. Yes, this is, it's fun, it's fun. And it's that kind of like, you know, social set sort of thing. And because Mitford is somebody who was that, as I will explain to you with the other thing that I have, um, she was like high society. So she's not the kind of person who's impressed by it. So she takes the piss in such a glorious way. Like you, in my opinion, if you want to read something as a commentary on the English, read that. Read her. She's, she's fucking wonderful. The Blessing, I know she wrote, I think she wrote this Between Love and the Cold Climate and Don't Tell Alfred. It's set in Paris again. But this isn't the same, like, world. I really don't actually know much about this, nor do I know about the others, really. It's more that because I have read Love and the Cold Climate, Pursuit of Love, and know that, like, I know her style really well, having read all of her historical biographies. Like, I personally don't think I can go wrong with Mitford, and if you've enjoyed any of her stuff, a lot of it is, it's same, same, but different. Like, a lot of it is just a continuation of that. In a way, you can argue maybe you read one, you read them all, but I've really enjoyed it, so I don't, I'm happy to go back again and again. Um, depends on your taste, these things will do. It isn't just Nancy who finds it difficult in France when Grace, along with her young son, CG? is finally able to join her dashing aristocratic husband, Charles Edouard, after the war. For Grace is out of her depth among the fashionably dressed and immaculately coiffured French women, and shocked by their relentless gossiping and bed, bed hopping. Um, and we thought we were bad. Um, when she discovers her husband's tendency to lust after every pretty girl he sees, it looks like trouble. And things get even more complicated when little Suju steps in. The Blessing is a hilarious tale of love, fidelity, and the English abroad, tailored as brilliantly as one of Dior's new look suits. Post-war Paris, anyone? Paris at all, anyone? <sighs> the Christmas Pudding. I'm saving this one for, I will read this on Christmas Day because I am that person, so I'm saving this one for Christmas. And this, I think, is very English countryside. Those ones are like the English abroad. This is English countryside in a way that Love and a Cold Climate really is, and the Pursuit of Love really is. Um, because you know, Mitford having grown up in the countryside, all that kind of stuff. The formidable fox hunter, Lady Bob. Oh yeah, if you don't like shit like fox hunting, yeah, you're not gonna enjoy these. Or maybe you'll appreciate it for what it was then, but they're like really like, let's go hunting. The formidable fox hunter, Lady Bobbin, is holding a Christmas house party. Attendees include her rebellious daughter, F Philadelphia, a pompous suitor, a couple of children poring over newspaper death notices, and a dejected writer whose first serious novel has been declared the funniest book of the year happens so much with like films at school it's the more serious it is the funnier it ends up being it's it's so bad but it happens out of the mix a beautiful ex san amabel 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 Fortes fortescue and her guests staying in a neighboring cottage and you have a ribbed te ribbed ribbed tale of um true love false fidelity hijinks and low morals not to mention the consumption of a considerable quantity of christmas spirit honestly it's gossip and it's really really funny all of Mitford's novels are, so I'll see how I find this one, but I'm gonna save this for Christmas. Mitford really is, in a way, same, same, but different. Um, but it's indulgence, it's pure fucking indulgence. This one, however, Wigs on the Green, 
I know it got into a fair bit of trouble <laughs> with the sisters, um, as we will discuss in a second. I think I've said this to you guys before, Mitford is one of the Mitford sisters. So you have the Duchess, the Communist, the Nazi, the writer, which is Nancy. That's four. There's two more. What were the other two? Basically, they're a set of six sisters. Um, six girls as is is just a lot, but they're really fascinating as like siblings. Nancy's my favourite, obviously. Um, but I think the Duchess of um her name is De her name was Deborah, the Duchess of um Fuck, uh, Duchess of Cavendish. Um, so the Cavendishes are Chatsworth. If you ever come to the UK, definitely go have a look at Chatsworth. Don't just stay in London. But like they have an interesting, an interesting family history. And I know that she got in a fair bit of trouble with her sisters for this, and I think this was out of print for a very long time because they were so pissed. No one is above reproach for Nancy Mifford, not even her fucking siblings. Eugenia Mallins is one of the richest girls in England and an ardent supporter of Captain Jack and the Union Jack shirts. Noel and Jasper are both in search of an heiress, so much easier than trying to work for their money. Poppy and Marjorie, Marjorie? Marjorie? Marjorie. Marjorie are nursing lovelorn hearts, and the beautiful bourgeois Mrs. Lace is on the prowl for someone to lighten the boredom of her life. They all congregate near Eugenia's fabulous country home at Chalford, and much fast ensues. Yeah, out of print for nearly 75 years. <laughs> Nancy's sisters, Unity and Diana, were furious with her for making fun of Diana's husband, Oswald Molesley. Molesley? Molesley. Molesley? and his politics, and the book caused a rift between them all that endured for years. <laughs> Nancy Mitford skews her family and their beliefs with her customary jewel barbs, but there is froth, comedy, and heart here too. She's fucking banter, I genuinely, if you ask one of those like, um, who would you have dinner, like dead or alive, who would you have dinner with, she would be on my fucking list, genuinely, she must have been so fucking, like, so much of her writing is fucking savage, you read it and then you're like, mm, and you reread it and you're like, wait, but like I said, the family's really interesting, so I bought Ons and Rebels by Jessica Mitford. So this is, again, one of the sisters. This is her, like, memoir of them growing up in the countryside, what that was like. I know that a lot of her books are semi-autobiographical in a way, so I figured may as well take another sibling perspective. Again, things with autobiographies, anything like that, you want to, like, take it with a grain of salt. My mum and I often joke that it's probably more fiction in this than any of the fiction over there, but, you know, it's... I guess at your discretion as the reader to just organise a little bit of critical thought being like <laughs> yeah I'm sure I'm sure that happened all right sure I'm sure it happened that way whatever you say but yeah I don't really know what to think of this I know there are quite a few like Mitford sister biographies but this is one that one of them wrote so I feel like if I'm going to start anywhere this is a decent place right right moving not really very swiftly on is this going to be a long video yes it always is actually while we're here Follow me on Goodreads. I always forget to plug my Goodreads. It's Emma Angeline. And if you want to follow me on everything else, it's at Sarcastic Fish. If you're like really new, Sarcastic Fish is what this channel used to be called. Uh, next up. Okay, we're gonna continue with the streak of buying things as a result of other things. So recently I read, finally, Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart. It was fucking fantastic. Like it's one of the, I said this on Goodreads, it's one of the best things I have read for a really, really long time. And I read it really quickly as well. I thought, well, it took me a week to read the first page and then it took me two days to finish the rest of the book. It's, it, it's one of those, but it's actually a trilogy. Things Fall Apart is set in Ni in Nigeria in like 1890s, um, around tribes of Igbo, Igbo, Igbo people, and like their clan and like they have nine villages and like how, their, like, their society works and stuff like how they, just basically how they fucking live their lives. It's kind of like little, to an extent it's little vignettes of like different um, stages of life and then the, like the rituals around that and like just how they just live before colonialism. So it's like a de, so it's like a, I wouldn't say decolonialized necessarily because Achebe obviously still grew up in Nigeria within a, post, well, in a colonial and post-colonial framework. I don't know, it feels less ethnographic than something like Heart of Darkness, obviously, which is the, the <laughs> colonial novel. Um, Colonizer novel, not colonial novel. Things Fall Apart is a really, 
really good book. And it deals with white Christian missionaries arriving and like when they're like, oh, we've given you like a faith and we've given you governance as if that's, they didn't already have that. But then sort of seeing like, yeah, like generational trauma and then like, the, like pain of these things like slipping away in a way that you can't always like do anything about it, kind of like feeling like it's grains of sand running through your fingers kind of feeling like there's really not very much you can almost do and you feel so powerless and all of that like it's really it's very very well written and especially like the i it made me care about yams next book in the trilogy is hour of god and then that the last one is no longer at ease this continues really to follow like the same like clan the same family the same like area just sort of seeing it like evolve over time so you really get that like kind of epic and also things fall apart was so you know like monumental in its publication and since like it sort of shifted the idea in the west at least of what the novel is because then if it's no longer something that the, only the west do well like what are the implications of that Coblet love to talk about that if you do anything post-colonial they'll love to talk about that um it's also just a good fucking like a good fucking book and a good fucking story i like achebe's writing i have what are these called essays slash speeches um achebe's africa's tarnished name really good Again, like thinking about like where a lot of the myths that you have in like Europe and the West and like just the white world um, about Africa and also the fact that we don't often differentiate when we say Africa. We're like, well, in this context, I very specifically mean Nigeria. I don't mean the entirety of Africa. Um, and then as well, like how almost irreparable it is when you come in and you just draw lines on a map and you take no regard for like where tribes have had beef for like a thousand years are and suddenly they have to be together in a nation where actually they're like <laughs> not exactly friends so like seeing that from like the inside out perspective especially if you're coming at it usually from a colonial perspective or post-colonial perspective it's just really interesting so yeah arrow of god is next ezulu headstrong chief priest of the god ulu is worshipped by the six villages of umaro but he is beginning to find his authority increasingly under threat from his rivals in the tribe and from those in the white government and even his own family he still feels he must be untouchable surely he is an arrow in the bow of his god armed with this belief he is prepared to lead his people even if it means destruction and annihilation yet his people will not be so easily dominated fast and powerful arrow of god is an unforgettable portrayal of the loss of faith and the struggle between tradition and change. Continuing the epic saga of the community and things fall apart, it is the second volume in Achebe's African trilogy and is followed by No Longer at Ease. I'm excited for this and the thing is, Achebe's writing, it's fucking brilliant. Um, there's something so... I feel like I could almost, the only thing I could say is almost sensorial, like you can see it, like you can see it, you don't just see it, you feel it and it's like he engages every single one of your senses in the story that he tells. And because of that, you can just feel it. And the capacity he has for generating empathy in a reader is is incredible. And I really, really recommend it. And I know that's what you guys come to me for often is something that you might not have seen somewhere else, especially if you haven't like done a literature degree. Like you want to read something incredible, read things fall apart. It's genuinely fantastic. And the next one is No Longer at Ease. Yes. I got all three of them in the same fucking edition. This is Things Fall Apart. No longer at ease. <laughs> oh, I'm so smug about this. I have all in the same edition. Oh, and they're such, so Things Fall Apart is so good about, you know, community and family structure and also gender is a really, really interesting one. Um, super interesting one to look at. And there's like family dynamics and then also like their kind of marriages that they have. Um, because the main character in that has um, three wives and then the fact like how they work together and like divisions of labor and all that kind of stuff and like really really interesting and just because it's not the way that you do it doesn't necessarily make it wrong or bad um really recommend i think this one is set a decent amount later i think this one's set kind of quite soon after things fall apart and this one's set a, quite a bit later right obi okonoa 
Aquino is an idealistic young man who, thanks to his privileges of an education in Britain, has now returned to Nigeria for a job in the civil service. However, in his new role, he finds that the ways of government seem to be backhanders and corruption. Obi manages to resist the bribes that are offered to him, but when he falls in love with an unsuitable girl, to the disapproval of his parents, he sinks further into emotional and financial turmoil. The lure of easy money becomes harder to refuse, and Obi becomes caught in a trap he cannot escape. Showing a man lost in cultural limbo and a Nigeria entering a new age of disillusionment no longer at ease concludes Achebe's remarkable trilogy charting three generations of an African community under the impact of colonialism. I'm excited. I think this is set in the 1950s. I'm really excited to read those and because I enjoyed Things Fall Apart so much I <laughs> I trust Achebe's writing and like I feel like I can vouch for his writing to you guys being like look if you enjoy Things Fall Apart get the entire fucking trilogy like why not? And I think I've made a decent crack, uh, I'm gonna say Nigerian literature, because I've read Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's, Adichie's Half of the Yellow Sun. I know she's a bit turfy, so if you buy her books, buy them secondhand. But if you guys, as far as African literature goes, if you have any more recommendations, because I'm aware I've done, you know, Nigeria, but that's obviously because British colonialism. I've done a bit of South African. What else have I read? I've done a bit of Egyptian. Yeah. Sally, seasons of season of migrations to the north. He is Egyptian, right? Sudan? Huh? <laughs> Don't mix those up. If you guys have any recommendations of stuff that you've read that you really enjoyed, or from your country, because I know there are a lot of you from fucking everywhere, you can leave them down there. You can leave them my DMs. You can leave them wherever you want. Leave them as comments because the rest of you probably want to see them as well. But yeah, this is your uh, month, weekly, monthly reminders to decolonialize your book self. D bookshelf. Bookself. Wear your bookself, especially if you're a white, cis, straight man. Remember to not just read books by other white, cis, straight men. Amazing. Someone left me a comment at one point being like, I didn't realise until you just pointed out that that's all I've been reading. Diversify, my friends. Books have made books <laughs> and empathy and understanding and more worldviews than just your own. And I've just realized how long this video is, so I'm gonna be so annoying. And I'm gonna cut this into two parts. So I'm really sorry, but I really hope you've enjoyed part one. Thank you very much for watching part one. Leave me any recommendations that you have in terms of videos you would like to see, or things you should think I should read, or if you've read any of these, like how did you find it? What do you think I should read first? My TBR is looking very exciting anyway, but come on, tell me what I need to put to the top of it. You can follow me on Goodreads at Emrangeline or on anything else at, at Sarcastic Fish. Thank you very, very much for watching. Like, subscribe, and all the jazz. And I'll see you guys on Thursday at 6 pm with part two. Bye. <laughs>